tell you guys a little bit about them. So we'll start with Patty. So Patty Comfort, she joined the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts as executive director in November of 2019. She comes to the League after seven years as executive director of the Women's Bar Association and the Women's Bar Foundation of Massachusetts. Patty began her legal career as in-house counsel to the National Association of State Public Interest Research Groups, where she focused on maintaining First Amendment access for the PIRG's political canvassers throughout the US. She also worked at the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation as a director of Equal Justice Coalition, building support among the private bar for access to justice through increased funding for civil legal aid programs in Massachusetts. She's an experienced community organizer, having worked with tenants in Boston's public housing developments, as well as with low-income tenants in Lowell. Patty is a graduate of Boston College and Northeastern University School of Law. Thank you, Patty, for joining us. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have Vedna Lacombe Haywood, who I mentioned is a board member at League of Women Voters, Massachusetts, and a member of the Plymouth Area League. She serves as a co-chair for the state DEI board and is a member of the Legislative Action Committee. She is currently an ICU RN at Brigham and Women's Hospital and has worked in the area of surgical burn trauma for over 20 years. She has served on several boards, which include the Southeast Massachusetts Division of the March of Dimes and the Plymouth Area Advisory Board for DCF. She currently serves as the chair of the Diversity Committee for the Town of Plymouth, the Haitian Community Partners in Brockton, and is an immediate past vice president for the Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. She was appointed member of the Managed Care Ombudsman Committee for the state of Florida and is a current elected school committee member for the Plymouth District, becoming the first black person to be elected in Plymouth's 400 year history. Bettner is a Haitian native who immigrated to the U.S. as a young child and was exposed to the importance of service, advocacy, and social activism through family, community, and church. Bettner, thank you for joining us. Um, we want to thank you both for being here with us. I think it's going to be a great discussion. So we'll have the discussion moderated by Courtney, and then we'll turn it over to Q&A. So as you're listening to this session, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, the chat box should be activated. You can use that to talk to other attendees or um, if the panelists say something that resonates with you and you just wanna chime in, you can say that there, but all questions please put in the Q&A. So I will now pass it to Courtney. Thank you, Jessica. That was a wonderful introduction. And I just wanna echo again, um, our, our gratitude and thanks for you guys both being able to join us tonight. I will go ahead and get started and I will start with Patty with this question. What are common misconceptions people have about representation? Um, yes, so thank you Courtney and Jessica and Phyllis. We just wanted to say that Vedna and I are really pleased that um, to be here with with Lambda Kappa Sigma in the Brockton area and AACP. So thank you for having us. Um, so uh, misconceptions about representation. So are you talking about um, people people on this side of the people of the constituents or folks uh, who are running for office i just wasn't quite clear about that sure i would say about the constituents the constituents okay so um i think that people there's a couple things going on i think that people feel sometimes like they're not qualified sort of to weigh in with their local representatives they don't know enough about an issue they're not an expert on the issue but Really, I mean, the, the representative is there to listen to everyone's opinion. So if, if someone, if you have a strong opinion about an issue that's affecting you and your community, you are the expert. I mean, you are the person that they want to hear from. So um, you should absolutely get in touch with them and make your opinion known. Um, I, I think that, you know, certainly at both at the federal and the state level, um, representatives and senators, they have staff, constituent services staff, and that's their sole job is to sort of, uh, you know, troubleshoot and, and, and work with um, constituents who call in and, and need their help. So, um, so folks should not feel that they need to have particular expertise on anything to, to weigh in with their rep. 
I think, I think also people think, well, my opinion doesn't matter. So why am I going to bother? And again, it's the same, it's the same reasoning. I mean, the representative is, is there to represent all of his or her constituents. And so I think that, um, you know, they, that's their job. So, you know, help them do their job by letting them know, you know, what, what's on your mind and, and how, you know, if you have suggestions for improvement on something or, you know, you have an issue with the way something's being run or, you know, any of those kind of things, that's, that's their job. That, that, that their job is to, you know, help, you know, help make those communities run smoothly. Um, and I guess the, the final thing I would say is, you know, people think, oh, somebody else will do that. Like, I don't have to step up and, and um, you know, someone else will take care of that. But I, obviously, if, everyone's, if everyone thought that way, you know, nobody would speak up. So um, I, I think that folks should feel empowered to, um, you know, make their voice heard um, and, and, and let their representative know when there's something that matters to them that is either not being handled correctly or, you know, they have a particular suggestion on how it could be better, that kind of thing. So I think people should, you know, just voice their opinion, basically. Absolutely, I agree. Um, we can't all have that mindset <laughs> when it comes to voting. Um, so I'll turn it over to Vetna. Um, so Patty kind of mentioned that, you know, we can, we should get connected with our, our local and federal representation. What are the best resources for people to use to learn more about, you know, more local, like the mayor? What, what would you recommend people use as a resource? And, um, and I'm just gonna ask for clarification, is this prior to running? Yes. Okay. So um, I would say prior to running, um, candidates forums, um, their respective websites, um, more often than not, they do have, you know, whether it be a Facebook site or a regular um, uh, website that they've um, erected, uh, grassroots organizations that may be supporting them or supporting political efforts within your town, um, uh, town party groups, um, if, you know, if it is a, um, a partisan if there is a like a, uh, I guess a, a partisan run, then um, going to their uh, to the uh, party groups, um, asking the candidates, specifically like when they are new, there is more of a tendency to have more access to them. So um, speaking directly to the candidates. Um, going to areas in which where they are like um speaking engagements um even creating coffees you know um i've gone to um people's homes where they've had these small intimate spaces um with the people that are running um in uh in your town or city and so it gives you an opportunity to actually ask um questions than uh, rather being in a larger larger group um and um about ballot of pedia um sometimes has some information regarding um, candidates that are running as well. There we go. And once these people are elected into office, how accessible should they be to their constituents? They should be accessible. Um, though um, the balance is difficult. Um, there is, it's because they are in their role now. And so um, they are balancing other things depending on the areas that they're covering. Um, if there's difficulty reaching um, your elected um, official, come, once again, come to where they are. Um, if you have to make appointments, um, if they happen to be an event um, that makes it a little bit more accessible um, for them. Uh, remembering also too, that um, they are just like you. So they now have this role as well as perhaps a job um, and families. So sometimes um, there is that difficulty emailing. Um, if they are people, um, depending on the type of office uh, that they have, if they have chief of staffs or reps for them reaching out to their reps um, and seeing um, if, answer, if questions can be answered in that way. Awesome. And Patty, I know you mentioned it briefly in the in the first question that I had asked you, but in what other ways can um, people participate other than voting? So I know a lot of people think, okay, I, I, I'm voting, and that's as far as they'll take it. What other ways can people participate in the political process? So I think, um, I think Phyllis really said it all when she um, did the intro and, and said, you know, well, two things. <laughs> We're in the fight for our lives. That's true. Um, and she said, remember, all politics are local, the famous Tip O'Neill, uh, you know, saying. Um, and so I think that, um, 
the non-electoral ways are are getting involved with issues um, that uh, you know affect you and your neighborhood, your your immediate community. Um, so is you know are you interested in recycling? Is there some kind of environmental group that you can get involved with locally? Um, if you are if you have kids in this in the school system, um, do you want to be involved in sort of the decisions that get made? You know, it, it, you know, within the school system, join the PTO. Um, that you know that kind of thing. Are you interested in, you know, working at a homeless shelter, either uh, by you know, um, you know, helping out with preparing the meals, or maybe getting on the board, or you know, if you if if, if homelessness is an issue that you're concerned about. So, I think that. Um, you know, those are the, the local issues are the things that grab people and tend to be the things that people, you know, either can have some control over or can um, be involved in and feel like they're making a difference because they're actually affecting, you know, their, their local community and, and, and real people in their town, in their city. So that's what I would say in terms of non-electoral is to just get involved in an issue that, that, that you care about. Um, and then obviously, I mean, this is obvious, but, you know, in terms of an electoral, then, then run for those things, right? Run for, get on the board of the PTO, run for, um, like, you know, Ven is on the school committee in Plymouth, run for school committee, run for the board of select persons, um, you know, go to town meeting, um, you know, different towns and cities have, um, you know, different uh, governance, the way they govern themselves. So the town I live in, it's town meeting, so everybody goes and, you know, every you you can you actually vote on the budget for your town, so that's directly affecting you know your pocketbook. So, um, so I think so I think those are sort of the ways to getting involved in issues and then actually running locally if that's not if if, if you feel you want to you know go that route. Awesome, thank you. I just wanted to. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> one of the I wanted to plug here the Vedna is working on um, a program um, with the Women's Pipeline for Change. I just wanted her to plug that program now so folks could put that in the calendar if it's something yes please yeah so um we're working on a like a women's symposium and it's going to be sometime in december um and it's called she is powerful there uh, I, I think it's collectively it's four or five of us um four or five organization and it's women's pipeline for change it's mass uh, women of color coalition um it's haitian community partners um the league and uh alpha kappa alpha sorority psi iota omega chapter so um in that particular um symposium we are looking at what does leadership look like um, and um, just hoping to um, empower and support. So empower um, women of color to actually um, run for office or run for leadership positions within their community, just like Pat Patty mentioned. If there's something that you are um, especially um, uh, have interest in um, within your community, um, what do you do to kind of um, become connected um, to that and actually um, perhaps uh, uh, make change. Um, so, um, and then um, also too, once you're in those positions, um, how do we continue to support you? I think a lot of times just um, when people come into positions, um, whether it's elected office or leadership, uh, sometimes some of the support that they had going into the position kind of dies off. So how do we continue to support each other um, within um, uh, those positions? So um, so hopefully people can join us in December um, to kind of get some, um, some nuggets um, to kind of lean on each other, um, to hear from um, women who have done this, um, not only in the South Shore area, um, but beyond. Um, and so, yeah. Absolutely. I, I worked with the pipe, Women's Pipeline for Change, and I will <laughs> echo the same. I think everyone should get involved. It looks like majority of the women are represented right now on the, on the webinar. So women, please take a look at that. I um, say we'll definitely keep an eye out for that. That sounds very interesting. I guess I'm actually very interested myself. <laughs> I did have a quick question um, that Patty mentioned. So town halls, not town halls, uh, town council meetings and like city council, those are open to the public? Yes, absolutely. Okay, I feel like that's something that a lot of, I People mean, I know, know I didn't know for a very long time. Um, yeah. Living in Boston, I'm like, wait, I can, I can go? And like, they post them online. Um, yes. That's great to know. To everybody out there, you can go to those meetings. Those are, yeah. <laughs> they are public. They're all subject to the open meeting law in Massachusetts. Ah. So the, the mem members of the public can attend those. They're public meetings. Great mm -hmm. to know. 
that. That's a great question, Jessica. I, I didn't know that. A, a lot of people didn't know that. Um, so Venna, this is a, it's a loaded question now that I'm, I'm looking at it over again. So please, um, this is strictly opinion. Um, I know that it has very different layers to it. So I'll just come right out and, and answer it. And then please feel free to answer it however you, you feel best. Okay. Um, and the question is, why don't more people vote in the United States? And what factors do you, do you think keep people out of the electoral process? Um, like you mentioned, it is very layered. Uh, so um, I'll break it up into yeah pieces. I think there are social barriers and then there are structural barriers. So the social barriers um, are just more um, subjective, which is just like apathy. As mentioned um, before, just in terms of uh, one of the first questions that you asked, um, people don't think that they're being heard. So, uh, so or their vote doesn't count. Um, so, um, so there's a tendency not to be involved. Um, so there's that apathy um, portion, the lack of civic in engagement, like the lack of civic um, education. I think mm -hmm. even in the United States that has died off. Um, I myself um, remember, I remember my civics teacher from high school. Um, he was, he was, influential in terms of how I viewed um, the process here in the United States, as well as um, I would say even um, my father. I, I, was, I was the five-year-old watching, um, watching what we uh, 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 were, thought we were going to watch last night, um, the presidential debates. So, um, so I, I was watching presidential debates with my father Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so was very aware of what that, you know, process was and the importance of it. But that's, you know, that is more um, at a, like, you know, a federal level, but honestly, how your, um, how voting affects you at a local level as well. Um, language, you know, we are a country of uh, many. And so sometimes, sometimes language is a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, access. Um, there's, you know, assumptions um, just uh, because we have um, poll places doesn't mean that everyone has access to those, those poll areas. So um, that's also um, um, a barrier, more, I think, more structural. And then um, address, not everyone has one. So um, it's figuring out um, how, you know, uh, people or citizens here can actually have access uh, to their polling sites. Um, Structural barriers, restrictive um, voter registration laws, which we, we've seen um, many of, um, and more so of since 2008. Mm -hmm. um, limited poll sites, um, that was evident um, obviously this year. Uh, we saw that happen in um, Georgia. Um, we believe we saw it happen in Michigan as well. Um, reduced polling hours um, for those who are working. So that restriction, um, voter purge. Mm -hmm. So you haven't voted in you know one or two elections prior, and so your your ability to vote um, uh, becomes limited. Um, rights restoration for those who have been incarcerated, uh, and the ability for them to vote now that they've essentially paid their you know their time, um, and voter ID laws. So another mm -hmm. restriction. So um, those are some of the reasons why I think that people don't. Absolutely. Don't we actually had a webinar previous to this one and it, it spoke on all of those things that you just mentioned there. So it's very interesting to see that um, and hear it come up again. Um, so with all of that said, Patty, what would you consider, um, what factors are important to consider when, when people are voting? What, do you, what are some main things that people should look for um, when they're voting for an elected official? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, I think especially now um, that we find ourselves in dealing, you know, with a pandemic um, and all all that means for voting, um, you know, in next month's election, I, I think that the most important thing is to make a plan to vote. So you need to, you know, know know where your polling location is. Um, double check your registration. Don't just assume, as Vedna just said, people get thrown off the rolls. I mean, thankfully, you know, we don't have as much of a problem with that as they do in other states, especially in southern states. But um, double check your registration. Um, you know, decide now are you going to vote in person on November 3rd 
Are you going to vote early during the early voting window um, in person when there won't be as many people, um, you know, at the polls? And the early voting place is not necessarily the place you vote when you vote on election day. So find that out. You can find that out on the Secretary of State's website, or you can call your local town clerk. I would put push people. The town clerks are totally overloaded now, um, so I would push people to the Secretary of State's website, um, which is actually quite good. Um, you know, are you going to vote by mail? If you are going to vote by mail, make sure you drop that ballot in the mailbox as soon as possible. So do not wait until the, the deadline to do that. Um, you could also drop it, it you, can, you can put your mail ballot in a drop box, find out where the drop box location is in your town. All this information is on the secretary, I'll put the secretary of state's web, um, website in the chat. Um, but all that information is on, is on the secretary's site. So I think the most important thing to consider for now, for, because we're in a pandemic, is make a plan. Know, know, what, when, know how you're going to vote. And then the other thing I would say is know what's on your ballot. Um, so the league is, has an online voters guide. It's vote411.org. Um, and if you go there and you put your address in, it'll, it'll bring up what's going to be on your ballot so that you can actually see who your candidates are, who's running against you, you know, what your choices are, and the ballot questions are on there too. So um, it, it includes everything from um, the federal level all the way down through contested county races. So um, you'll be able to see everything that's, you know, pertains to you. And so if you look at your ballot ahead of time, then you can make your decisions. Who, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote yes or no on the two ballot questions? Um, and you'll get some information in there. We have a candidate, you can do a side-by-side -side comparison and compare the candidates' um, stands on the different issues. So, so that will help inform, you know, who better represents, you know, your, your ideas. Um, so that, that's what I would say. Have a plan to vote and know what's on your ballot. Can I just chime in real quick, Courtney? Um, the Vote 411 is amazing. So if people haven't checked that out, <laughs> definitely look at it. I use, <laughs> I use that a lot. And like you can send Good. it to yourself. They send you an email and you have, it's, it's amazing. Um, so I would right. definitely encourage people to go there and use that tool. Um, but I did want to just highlight, there was a question that came in through the Q&A and I know we're going to have a question, but it's uh, related to this. So it's, the question is, what are your thoughts on voters mailing in their ballots? Um, and yeah. either if you could chime in on that. Good question, yeah. I mean, this is what I would say. Um, there, there, are, it, it is, there are states, first of all, in the, in, the United, in the country that have been voting by mail for a long time. I have a relative in Washington state who said to me, you guys still go to the ballot box? But, you know, so this is, people vote by mail all the time. Donald Trump votes by mail. Um, Obviously, we're in a situation now where there are states who, like Massachusetts, has passed a law um, in the recent months to deal with the pandemic that allows for a lot more mail voting. So um, what I would say is I think that, you know, despite the problems with the, the post office, they, they handle something like 185 million pieces of mail every day. Um, so I think that I personally feel confident that as long as you don't hold, you get your ballot in the mail, you don't hold on to it too long, fill it out get it back in the mail with plenty of time between the time you put it in the mailbox and the election and election day, you'll be fine. Um, and if people aren't comfortable with that, um, I also should say, I think that the, the vote by mail in the primary here in Massachusetts went very well. I mean, there were a few glitches, um, but, but by and large, it was a huge success. So people should know that. Um, and then, and then the other thing I would say is, I just lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> um, that if you don't feel comfortable, you want it, you don't want to go to the polls in person, take your mail ballot and drop it in your local drop box. Um, and again, um, you know, do that as early as, as you want and, and that your vote will absolutely be counted. So that's what I, that's what I have to say about that. I mean, it's unfortunate that, you know, the president of the United States is casting doubt on, um, on mail, on mail by uh, vote by mail processes and calling into question everything and even before it's even happened um but but i you know just like a lot of things that come from that white house um i think it's exaggeration and inflammatory and you know all those words that that go with 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 what, what what's happening um nationally so i i feel comfortable with vote by mail and and i encourage everybody to take you know take advantage of it Absolutely. And like Washington, Ohio, where I'm actually originally from, we've done mail-in ballots for, oh my goodness, for as long as I can remember. So it's not a new concept. Right. Um, 
No. You mean your balance are like not in the river or like in somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> they actually get there. Surprisingly. Yep. <laughs> Surprisingly, yeah, that was a good one. Thank you uh, Courtney, yeah. for letting me slide that in. Yeah, absolutely. No, that, that was right. That was timely to put that right in there. So this is one of my favorite questions, just because I, I read so much on this. So, um, and I will direct this to Patty. Um, women have consistently voted and registered in high numbers, and they've actually outvoted men on several occasions. Why might this be the case? And I also have a follow-up question to that. Since women now make up the majority of voters, why are um, and the registrants as well? Why are women not better represented, like represented in ele uh, elected offices? Mm -hmm. The two part are there. Yeah, sure. Um, so the 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 research shows that um, over the course of the last five midterm elections, so dating back to 1998. Um, women have turned out in higher numbers than men. So in, in, the, tw in the 2018 midterm elections, women were 55% um, of the vote and, and men were 51.8%. So, so definitely higher, not, not huge, but higher. Um, and historically, um, un unbelievably or, or unbelievably now, um, the Republican Party platform was the first national party platform to endorse the Equal Rights Amendment, um, you know, way back when. Um, they, I should mention that they dropped it off their platform in 1980, but prior to that, they were the first national party to endorse it. And going back as far as the Nixon admi administration, the party platform included um, childcare services, more flexible work arrangements um, to allow balance for childcare and work um, between men and, and, and women. So I think that, I think that that resonated with a lot of women, um, you know, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and, and, and maybe one of the reasons why, you know, why more women have traditionally uh, voted than men. The other thing I think to consider is that, you know, women um, tend to be the caregivers. I mean, obviously that's changing a little as we kind of have come up to the present day, but historically and traditionally, women have the caregiver role. Um, and so especially lower income women um, would have more interaction with governmental service agencies. They rely on, um, government services for food stamps and that kind of thing. Um, so, and then, and then all women who are caregivers, they interact with their children's schools, the healthcare system, if they're caring for an older parent, um, social security and, and, and a lot of governmental agencies. So I think that they're just more sort of, um, I don't know, in tune with what, what government does, what, what, what agencies and what regulations they have to follow and think just because they're interacting with all of these government agencies in their role as caregivers. So, so that's one idea about why women might be more, um, you know, apt, more um, prone to vote than men. Um, and I think, I think the reason, I think the reason women, there are more women um, in elected office is very simply, it's this sort of, um, this idea that, that research has shown that a woman has to be asked seven times yes. to run for office. Yes. So not once, not twice, not three, but seven times. So um, this is so it's a problem of recruitment, um, you know. So the program that that Vedna just talked about in terms of um, you know kind of getting getting information out to women to encourage more women to run, these are all these are all great um, programs so that so that women understand that no, you don't have to be an expert in you know nineteen thousand things in order to um, you know to run for office. You don't have to know everything. Um, you just have to have the you know, the will and, um, you know, the sort of the eagerness to, to want to take that on. So, so I think, I think recruitment is the main problem. Um, and, and the fact that men just tend to think that they can do it and they don't need to be asked seven times. They, they just have, they just think that they're capable and women take more convincing to, um, you know, to, to encourage them and, 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 and for them to believe in themselves that, yes, I can do this. So I think that's sort of the age old problem. Um, so funny that you brought up the uh, statistics about how women have to be asked seven times. I actually have this book, just a side note. I got it for my birthday a couple years ago. Um, it's called Represent the Woman's Guide to Running for Office and Changing the World. And it actually had that statistic in there. Yeah. I remember reading that. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think women do have to be pushed and nudged a lot more. And men just automatically know that that's what they want to do. So thank you for yeah. that. 
I, I just want to piggyback on what um, sure. said, just even here in um, Mass. So when you look at your, um, your senators um, at the state level that have run, so uh, um, since we've had senatorship here in Mass, over 20,000 men have been senators and only 200 women. Wow. And only 200 women. So it's, it's really, it's, you know, the phenomenon, um, you know, I guess makes sense. Um, how do we begin to encourage women to make those same steps that say the 18 year olds in Southeastern Mass who decides who wants, he wants to be mayor make <laughs> as opposed to, <laughs> you know what I mean? As opposed to the, the, the 35 year old who thinks she has to finish you know, her masters and everything else in order to do the same thing. Exactly. How do we bridge that? Yeah. Wow. Awesome. I'm so happy for the Women's Pipeline for Change because you guys are changing all of that. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we'll go ahead and move on to the next question. And then um, I'll skip a few just because of the sake of time. I want to leave time for everyone else to answer, ask questions. Um, what are the advantages of allowing voters to vote early um, in using absentee ballot? I know we kind of touched on it a little bit with the mail-in ballots from the question that we got from Deidre, but um, we'll, we'll kind of talk about a, a little bit about the absentee ballots and the advantages of allowing that. Yeah, um, so, I, so we'll talk about sort of pandemic, no pandemic. So when there's no pandemic, I think that um, Early voting, um, uh, early voting hours and locations um, allow many more people to exercise their right to vote than, than if you just if you just had voting on election day. So, um, especially low wage workers who absolutely cannot miss uh, work. You know, they have no benefits, they have no time off, paid time off. Um, so they can't, they can, they have to balance you know, losing income um, and exercising their constitutional right to vote. Um, so I, I think that um, by, by having early voting hours, you allow that person um, who doesn't have a job with, you know, who, with a salary and, and paid time off and things like that, you allow that person to be able to vote, um, to vote and keep keep their job and, and, and not lose income. Um, so having, you know, voting um, hours that fall on the weekend, that fall, after uh, normal business hours, nine to five, that, that just enfranchises um, a whole host of, of people that otherwise might, you know, not either not be able to vote. I have to make a very hard choice about, you know, losing income and, and voting. Um, and, then, uh, and then during a pandemic, it is obviously um, allows people who are otherwise vulnerable to the virus to not have to choose between compromising their health and voting. So, um, they're able to go, if they do want to do it in person, they're able to go when there aren't going to be a lot of other people there. And because the window this year is um, so big, um, they, it's, it's, you know, they, they're able to um, pick and choose when is best for them. And there won't be very many people there. So they're not risking exposure to the virus. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and in terms of absentee voting, um, that was the only kind of voting we had in Massachusetts until we passed this law um, in early July. And so in Massachusetts, um, typically only about 4% of people prior to this year, this election, um, typically only four, about 4% 4 voted absentee. And you need, a, you need a, one of three excuses to vote absentee. You either have to be, for religious reasons, you can't go to the polls on election day, you're, you have a disability which prevents you from doing that, or you're out of um, you're out of town. You're out of the state um, to be able to participate. So, basically, what what's happening now is um, the, for all intents and purposes, the new vote by mail law allows everyone to vote absentee. I'm just going to use those two use those two terms interchangeably. There are technical differences, but that by and large, that's what it is. Um, and and I think that you know one of the part of the question, Courtney, I think was why would states allow or not allow absentee? And I think that. It, it just, the league has for a long time worked um, with other organizations in Massachusetts and an election modernization coalition. So we work with the um, ACLU of Massachusetts, those lawyers for civil rights, MassPerg, um, Common Cause Massachusetts on voting reforms because prior to about 10 years ago, Massachusetts was really in the dark ages in terms of voting reform. So for the last, over the last 10 years, we've, we've, um, we've 
pushed for um, automated automatic voter reg. So anytime you interact with the registry of motor vehicles or mass health, you automatically get registered to vote. So that's a fairly new thing here in Massachusetts. Now you can register online to vote and you can pre-register when you're 16 or 17. So there's been a few reforms. And I think that I think that vote by mail is 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 the reform that we need to adopt permanently in Massachusetts. Um, the current law sunsets on December 31st. So it's only for this election that the vote by mail law is in place. Um, but you can be sure that that's what we're going to be pushing for in the next, next legislative session is to make sure that vote by mail becomes the norm in Massachusetts. Absolutely. I know we had a few other questions, so I'm going to skip over to the census here um, just because of time. Mm -hmm. um, we've been hearing this, I at least I have, um, quite a lot, and we've, I've been getting emails to urge everyone to finish it. So how important are the census? Uh, I'll direct that to Vedna. So um, the census is very important. Um, <laughs> so um, the census just takes um, federal funding um, for every municipality. Uh, so there's an allocation of $600 billion of federal funds annually um, for programs that are varied um, through a, throughout your communities, whether that be um, Medicare, Medicaid, housing programs, transportation, um, education, um, construction, health centers, um, uh, home energy, SNAP. Massachusetts receives 22 billion or had, did receive $22 billion um, dollars in, the 20, in 2016 based on the 2010 census. So, um, and that's a fund that benefits every um, resident in Mass. So per household within your community, I believe it's, I think it's like 22 or $2,300 um, within that range um, uh, per household. Um, that's what it equates in terms of funding. So if you are undercounted, so Brockton was undercounted by 30, um, like I, I believe it's like 30%. Um, that equates to millions of dollars that the city does not receive because people have not filled out their census. Um, the Electoral College uses the data to determine how many votes each, um, each state gets. The census determines um, congressional districts, districting lines. Um, the um, redistricting maps will be formed after this census is completed um, and like collated. And then, um, and so that will also um, uh, determine in terms of your city and or town um, precincts. Uh, it determines um, what the school districts will look like in terms of lines um, and your city council. Uh, and that's for the next 10 years. So it's, it's, very, it's just very, very important. Um, it also dictates, it allows us as, um, as uh, residents of the US um, to dictate our story, to tell everyone here who and how, who we are and how many of us are here. So particularly in marginalized communities, um, you can say there are, say, you know, I'll take my, um, there are 150,000, you know, um, Haitian Americans who live in Massachusetts, as opposed to the story that could be told of 90. And so therefore, you undercut any type of programming um, or um, services and or resources that could go to those communities. So it's your ability to dictate the story and not allow someone else to do that for you. Um, also know that um, organizations use this data, businesses use this data to say, hey, um, you know what, X amount of people live here, that means I can go into this community, give this type of business, um, because I know that, um, you know, there, there's constituency to kind of, um, uh, kind of like serve my, not, not necessarily serve my business, but um, um, patronize my business. Um, and it's a constitutional mandate. It's a constitutional mandate. Um, it's mandated by um, the Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution. So, um, the census, it's important in sense. Yes, it is very important. I have one little thing that came in Q&A. Okay. That's about census. So I want to like slide it in there. Okay. Um, it mentions that the deadline is now October 5th. Is that correct? October 5th. Um, and the census, what are they called? The census workers? The enumerator. enumerator yep. 
can pronounce the word. That's why I asked. Um, <laughs> um, they're still out trying to uh, gather information. So if they come to your door, everyone, please. So yeah. there was a case. Um, I don't know, Patty, you want to speak on that in terms of the case um, uh, because it was supposed to be. Yeah. So uh, so what ha the 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 info in the chats right at October fifth is now the deadline. Um, I think the I think the I'm not exactly sure, but I think the overall the the case said that they could have till October thirty first. But I think there was some internal decision um, that the census folks made about making it, um, the data gathering to end on the 5th and then are they going to use the rest of that time to, I don't know what, do some, uh, I don't know, collating or something, I don't know. Um, but I think that is correct, October 5th is the last, is the, is the final day for data collection. Perfect. Okay. Great. So, um, one thing that our, our chapter, Lambda Kappa Sigma chapter, we pride ourselves on is connecting with other organizations that have similar efforts as ours and, and mission statements. So I wanted to give you guys the opportunity to tell us more about the organization as a whole and, and how can women um, who are looking to get involved get in contact with you. Yeah. Um, so thank you for letting us do that. So um, the the I don't know if, if people know, but the League of Women Voters is the organization that grew out of the suffrage movement. Um, so the League was founded three months before the ratification of the 19th Amendment. Um, and it was founded by the, the women who were at the forefront of the suffrage movement because they knew that winning the, winning the vote was really only the first step, that, that women were going to be needed to be educated not only about the newly won right to vote, but also about civic engagement in general, um, because women have had been just not allowed um, to, to, to engage civically um, up until that time. Um, so that's so that's what we are. So we're celebrating our 100th anniversary this year. Um, and, and for the past 100 years, that's what that's what the League of Women Voters has been doing. We've been educating not just women, but everyone, um, you know, about about voting and about um, public policy matters. Um, so we're organized. We're organized in a three-tier system. Um, we have, there's a there's a national league uh, based in Washington D.C. There are state leagues in every state, um, and then there are local leagues that are part of um, part part of the um, the organization as well. So in Massachusetts, we have about um, a little over 3,000 members, um, and we have 48 um, local leagues throughout throughout the Commonwealth. Um, and that's how, you know, we're talking about local, getting involved locally and uh, politics is local. That, that's absolutely how our members get involved. They, they get involved with what's, you know, Vedna can, can speak to this, get in, they get involved with what's happening in their, in their local town. And if there's not a league in their town or near their town, then they form one. So, um, you know, that's, that's really how our members come to us is by getting involved locally. Um, and at the state level, we're involved in everything. We have, we have a robust legislative action committee. We have 18 legislative specialists. These are all volunteers and they are our experts on everything from, you know, climate change to voting reform, um, to immigration, all the issues, um, that the league takes positions on. Um, and we typically follow more than a hundred bills, um, every legislative session. So this is a ton of work that, you know, we have dedicated volunteers who are doing that. Not, we have a very small staff. It's just myself um, and two other and two other staff people. Um, at the national level, we're involved in all manner of, um, you know, public policy issues as well as lawsuits. We're involved. The, the the national league is involved in a lawsuit over redistricting at the Supreme Court. Um, the, they're they're they filed a suit over what was going on with the post office. Um, so they're the 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 National League has a lot of resources um, and uses those resources um, on behalf of um, all the public policy issues that matter and that, that we take stand, take positions on. And as Vedna said, she, she went to a convention. We have a, con the National has a convention every two years. And um, the first one she went to, she said she was so impressed with people who were members. It was some, you know, people from the Obama cabinet um, here in Massachusetts, our state auditor, our state treasurer, our, our members. Um, so there really are, you know, sort of, uh, you know, impressive folks who are, who are members. Charlie Baker's mother was a lifelong member. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's an old organization. So it has that, um, it has that feel of, of sort of having people involved for a long time as well. Um, and Edna, do you want to add anything? 
I do. I do. Um, I will say, so I joined the, um, the league um, a couple of years back and in my, um, my first experience with it. So to t as Patty mentioned, I joined the league through something through um, a, another town committee. So it was through our diversity committee through the town. We had done probably, I guess, three or four years ago, did a policing in um, a diverse community um, symposium. So we put it together after um, the Flando Castile and Eric Gardner um, <clears throat> deaths. And it was a former league member of the local league um, that came up to me that day and said, Vedna, you need to join the League of Women Voters and you need to run for office. And, um, and um, oddly enough, I said, I'm not gonna run for office, I'll join the League though. Um, and so <laughs> I, um, I joined the League and I joined the League um, subsequently months, um, like probably a few months later. Um, and when I joined the League, they were such a welcoming um, group of people. Um, it, the League here in Plymouth has been here for 60 years. Uh, and so well established. And so um, in that, um, so I joined the league. Um, one of the first events that I went to was a legislative um, dinner at someone's house where our house of rep and our senator was in that person's home. And we had the ability to speak to them regarding bills that were one specific to our community and two specific to um, the state as well. And I just, I was just, very um, surprised at how accessible these people were. Um, the fact that you're in someone's home and you're actually speaking to your house rep and your senator, um, and um, and the fact that we can, um, you know, actually speak to what we feel um, uh, these issues are to us, um, and literally, <clears throat> and they were kind of, they were the group that you know kind of pushed and said, you know. Um, when we had uncontested um, races um, within our town, they were like, people need to run. And so, and supported me in that. So um, this is what the league was. And then subsequently that year, went to convention in Chicago and to see these prolific women on stage, we had the previous US treasurer who was a leaguer, who was there. Um, like she mentioned, you had um, attorneys that had particular cases that were going to the Supreme Court that were there in the, in, you know, in the name of the league. Um, a, a woman who actually ran for mayor in Chicago, leaguer. It was just, it was, it was wonderful. So to me, I can't, actually, I can't say enough about this um, <laughs> um, organization. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to add, we, there's, we've got loads of volunteer opportunities, not just necessarily through us, but through um, organizations that we partner with. So if people are, again, we don't have a major problem in Massachusetts, but if you're, we will be doing election protection um, uh, efforts on November 3rd. So if, if folks are interested in that, if you're interested in phone banking on Get Out the Vote, we're going to be, the, the census phone banking is going to turn into um, Get Out the Vote phone banking, and it's, and we're, we're targeting low propensity voters, voters who you know, typically aren't um, definitely going to vote to encourage them to make sure they're registered and make sure they vote. So I, I put my mine and Vedna's email in the chat. If anyone is interested in any of those volunteer opportunities, please reach out to us and we'll hook you up with what makes sense for you. Um, and obviously we're totally um, <laughs> willing to talk to you if you want to join the league as well. We'd love to have you. So quick thing that I just realized, apparently I disabled the chat, so it's only been going to the panelists. However, oh. <laughs> I will. <laughs> the copy of the chat is saved. I'll send that in the follow-up email. I'm trying to find a way to copy and paste, but it won't let I'm me. I'm sorry. Okay. I no, it's fine. I just realized that. So I've been trying to figure this out, but I will send a follow-up email and I'll include all the links that have been posted in there in the follow-up. Thank you, Jessica. No problem. So those were the end of my questions. Um, Jessica, I don't know if you want to handle reading the questions that came in from the attendees or if you want. Can you see it on your end? Yeah, I can't okay. see it. Yeah, no, feel free to go for it. Okay, for sure. So um, the first question that we have is, do you feel that high school students who just graduated will vote in this year election? I, um, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, I think a lot of times, you know, um, we, we think that, you know, why don't kids, you know, why don't um, high school or youth um, not vote? Um, but I think they're, they're not encouraged. Um, I think we don't, we don't bring them into the conversation. Um, 
but I think in these past few years, we have seen um, such a rising in terms of um, what they feel regarding um, uh, certain um, uh, social things that are happening here in the United States. Um, I, I feel like we will see those those participant participation. I'm sorry, participate. Part, I can't even talk. Um, <laughs> participation numbers go up in terms of the youth vote. Um, uh, when we saw the incident that happened in um, uh, a couple of years back in um, in Parkland, and how um, high school students were able to organize throughout this country regarding a specific topic, the ability that students have cut, whether it be high school or just youth within that pot, you know, that range, I would say 16 to 25, um, uh, to, to kind of change or switch that narrative. Um, it, it's, it, you know, they have the ability. They almost brought down, um, a widely regarded organization. And so I hope, I hope they understand how powerful their voice is. Um, so uh, it's a hope. I, I, I think they, I think I, you're just beginning to see more and more activity on their end. Um, even in our particular league, um, our league, our age range is mm -hmm. anywhere from the 80s to juniors in high school. We now, in this past, actually this past year, we have now, we have a board member who is a junior, who is actually a sophomore in high school, just, I'm not sorry, sophomore in college. And then we have two new um, league members who are um, juniors in high school. So you're beginning to see more and more um, of their participation and understanding um, in terms of what their voice is um, in this. Yeah, and I just to add on to that, you know, I think one of the constituencies that will be included in that get out the vote phone banking will be first time voters or folks that are on the rolls that haven't been on before, because the, obviously they need encouragement to go out and do it for the first time. So to what extent those are young people, I don't really know. But in, in terms of first time voters, that they will definitely be someone that will be targeting for, you know, encouraging to get to get to the polls. Awesome. So the next question we have is, um, given that many communities are showing a low census response, how else might cities and towns be able to recoup dollars that they're missing out by this problem? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't really have an answer for that. I think that, um, you know that when the census when the when the data gathering um closes there is i don't i don't think there's any like amendment process is there Vedna? i don't think there's any way to get in you know additional information yeah um i don't think so i know that states do gather information in terms of the res you know like the residents um that um do happen there but in terms of just like federal dollars um being doled out that mm -hmm. that is um that is the census, but there are, the states do evaluate, I think every couple of years, um, even cities, cities and towns also as well, evaluate um, who their residents are. And I believe that at least um, state dollars are allocated in a sense, but not, not to the extent of what the census can give over, remember this is over a 10 year period. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the last question that we have, um, does Massachusetts allow convicted felons to vote while incarcerated? If not, is there a push to allow them and can they vote after being released from prison? Um, I should know the answer to this question. Um, there are certain uh, uh, felons, convicted felons cannot vote in Massachusetts, I, I think is the right answer. Um, but there are, um, there are folks that are in prison and the league is working with other organizations right now um, in, to, in term, to try to get access, uh, ballot access to those folks who are in jail, um, but who are, not, who, are not, who are not convicted of a felony because they do have a right to vote. So folks that are in for misdemeanors, um, and the question is, you know, they're in prison, they're in jail so that they, you know, they don't have access to the ballot box. So we're working with 
um, some of the sheriffs around the state um, in order to, you know, make an, get a program going where we can get ballots into the folks that are eligible to vote. Um, so that's so so that's what we're doing on that. But convicted felons are are not eligible to vote in Massachusetts, as of as of right now. Yeah. The league has taken position um, on that issue, um, where we support legislation to overturn that, and we're working with other organizations. But that legislation is dead for this session, this legislative session, um, and probably will be reintroduced next year. Um, yeah, I th um, so actually up until um, two thousand. Um, we actually allowed, the, the Massachusetts allowed um, felons to vote while they were incarcerated. Um, right. Yeah. That's right. I remember that. Yeah. And then, and then, and then it got, it got voted away. Yeah. So now their voting rights are, up, you know, they are suspended while they are yeah. incarcerated. But I, I have to say, I, I, the, one of the first things I did when I first got this job was I visited um, MCI um, Norfolk um, with our with our um, criminal justice specialist, um, Colleen Kirby. And um, we spoke to the, the it was the, light, the, the name of the group was Life, the Lifers something, but they were in for, they were in um, life imprisonment. And I, you know, I've heard the statistics. I know the statistics about how overwhelmingly um, folks with a life sentence are overwhelmingly black and brown. But when I walked into that auditorium, I, it was just so, plain that um, one that you know overwhelmingly people were black and brown um, and it was all men um, and the other thing though was that how they obviously everyone in that room or uh, the ones that came up to talk to us at the end um, had completely turned their life around I know I'm going off on a tangent but these are you know whatever happened that put them there they were not the same person you know at, at the time that I was talking to them so there's a there's a big there's a lot of work going on not just with the league but with other organizations and, and the and the the people who are in prison themselves to try to um, do something about that law um, so that at least that they can exercise their right that they can exercise the right to vote um, you know especially for folks that have already, you know have turned their lives around so we're so I don't know where that's going to go like I said that legislation is dead for the bill is dead this year but um, my guess is that it will be re reintroduced next year. We have to be mindful too of other states who are having some of that difficulty, even though they have passed laws to allow um, people who have served time um, to actually vote. Look at Florida, where they voted on this yeah. probably um, a little less than two years ago, and now there's attempts. Um, now they're they're doing these, you know, voter re um, voter restrictions and stating, oh, you have to pay your fees. So it's like you know this this. Um, uh, tax, you know, in terms of like voter restrictions that we saw years and years and years ago and now are being re-implemented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we had one more question that came through the chat to the panelists. I'm not sure if you guys can see it on your end. Um, I am not quite sure exactly what is asking. I want to make sure we answer it correctly. So, um, the participant that asked the question, I'm going to click, let's see if this works. Um, it, says, it says allowed to talk. Um, so Robin Chen, um, your question, I will click allowed to talk and perhaps if you're available, you can ask it. If not, then we can just read it off and hopefully um, we answer correctly. Um, but you don't have to turn your, oh, it brings her in. Okay, you don't have to turn your video on. <laughs> oh, hi. Can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you. Hi, well, um, so nice to, to have this great forum tonight. Um, I appreciate you taking my question. Um, so we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's right to vote, but I can't help but notice that a quarter of our population is still disgrantized based on their age, and that's to say people under age 18. Now, legislators have an incentive to work not only for their constituents, but for the voters live in their district and when children can't reward legislators for working for their issues then they're categorically marginalized in the public policy space now you might say that parents and teachers vote for children but that's called virtual representation and women had that before we demanded the right to vote so it seems to me that we're in the place we are now just because this has been the path of history so far but 
it would seem like the next century of the League of Women Voters ought to include examining this and saying, well, how can we have direct accountable representation across the lifespan? And see, I would not have done that justice. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And I want to see, hopefully, okay, perfect. So Robin, the way I would answer that is I'm counting on you to carry that ball forward. <laughs> um, I, you know, as, as Robin knows, and I don't know if Edna knows as well, but um, that the league at, at, at the current moment does not have a position on, on this issue. Um, and so the way that the league works is they have, you know, they're, they, they study issues um, and sort of, they, they go through this very sort of um, intense process where they study an issue um, and then come out with um, a consensus on whether or not to, to go forward and support an issue or, or not take any position on it. So um, Robin is, is um, a great advocate for this issue um, and has been doing um, a lot of outreach and um, sort of networking and, you know, crossing her T's and dotting her I's to try to, to get this moved forward um, on the league's agenda. And I know she's working with other organizations as well. So um, I, I look forward to, you know, seeing um, what progress that she can make. And, and um, I think that she's, you know, in the process of building sort of co a coalition around the issue and, um, you know, look forward to sort of what she can, how far she can carry it and, and whether or not we're actually going to get to the point where um, that's going to be something that the league um, takes a position on. I just don't have, I just don't know. I, at this moment, I'd have no idea what, you know, where that'll go. But we're counting on you, Robin. Yeah, that was a great question. I, I never actually thought of that. That's really great. Um, I think, oh, did another one come through? Okay, here, another question just came come in. Um, so that one is, I heard that former Mayor Bloomberg was going to pay fines for several ex-prisoners in Florida because they can't vote until they are paid. Yeah. Has anyone heard this? And if so, is this legal and wouldn't allow, and would it allow these folks to vote? I heard that too. And it's not just him. It's a lot of other people. Michael Jordan, a bunch of celebrities have done this, have, have also done that. Um, I, I don't, I mean, if, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, okay. I oh, know if you wanted to. Um. No, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't think it's illegal. I think if the, the fines get paid, they get paid. Um, so, but, but I know that there's a lot of people that have stepped up to, to pay the fines so people can vote. I, I know that he has donated quite a bit of money. He's raised, um, I think it's over $16 million, and he has donated $5 million to the Florida um, Rights Restoration um, uh, Committee or Council, whichever uh, organization, um, to kind of um, assist with that. Um, he is currently pouring in a lot of money into Florida. Um, my understanding is close to $100 million um, just to um, kind of push um, uh, or kind of, um, I, I'm assuming, mitigate um, some of the barriers that people have towards voting um, within that state. Um, I can say as a former resident of Florida, um, it is uh, needed. <laughs> um, I, I was, um, I did live in the time or was living in Florida when we had the Chad's issue. Um, I lived in the county that, that gave um, that president um, um, his supposed um, office in a sense. And so um, understanding what it is to um, kind of be or have your vote, um, I don't know, not even say marginalized, but um, having issues in terms um, the um, the validity of your vote um, being questioned. So um, yeah, so it, so yes, um, I believe it, it is. I mean, it's legitimate if it's going through particular organizations that do assist um, in this um, to begin with. So um, I agree with that. Yeah. And it, yeah, and it is happening. Yeah. I think that was the question. So. I think that is all the questions. Um, Jessica, I don't know if I'm missing anything. No, nope, it looks good on my end. Great. I really like that feature where people can talk. That was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that was pretty cool. But no, I think that is um, all the questions that we have. So just a round of applause for you all because you all did great. Um, I think the conversation was very educational. Um, lots of questions from the audience, so that was great. Um, so as our time today comes to a close, I just want to thank you both again for being with us. Um, and thank you all that are on and listening and watching. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us. We know that time is very precious these days. So uh, we definitely appreciate it. Um, and I would, um, Vedna and Patty, I would say to you all, if you guys need us for anything and um, oh. definitely reach out. Um, we will definitely be in touch. I'm like slightly intrigued. Not that I need anything else added to my plate, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm slightly intrigued. Um, no, and this was great. When we reached out, you guys were very responsive. Um, so I just want to thank you both for sure. that. Courtney, anything? Um, I just want to add on to that. Please keep us um, in your in, you know, in your plans. If you ever have something in the future, we would love to continue this partnership. Um, I know a side of this sorority, I'm speaking just as an individual, I'm, I'm interested um, in all of the work that you guys do, especially um, what you guys are doing with the Women's Pipeline for Change. I've, we've partnered with that group, uh, with the NAACP, I've partnered with them, and I, I love working with Shahara and Cheryl Crawford all the time. Um, thank you guys again. This was great. I actually might be one of my favorite uh, webinars. <laughs> I hate to be, I hate to have a favorite, but I really enjoyed this one. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I, we really appreciate um, you reaching out to the league. And just like you said, you love partnering with us. We really appreciated partnering with you both. So we would love to do more stuff um, like this in the future. So let's keep in touch. Definitely. Absolutely. Everyone, again, anything in the chat that you did not see, I will send out a follow-up email. Courtney, that book, I'm going to need the title because I'm going to include that too. Absolutely. Um, we got a, a comment that says this was great and thanks us all for this. Uh, so yeah, I think that's the way to close it out. We will share the recording. Um, it'll be we'll try to get it onto YouTube and then we'll put it on our website as well. So we'll share the link to that when we have it. Um, but thank you all and be well and have a great evening. Great. Thank you again. Thank Take you. care.